Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Before we, you know, before the comedy routine starts, why don't we go ahead and start the last session of the day in our panel discussion on business interoperability. Um, so in a moment here, I'm gonna ask everyone to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they're doing in blockchain, but I just wanted to set the stage a bit around what it is that we're talking about today. And that is, when we look at technologies such as blockchain, they have the power to solve complex challenges and achieve improved supply chain traceability. So in order to tap into this powerful technology, interoperability, and we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about that today, interoperability that is enabled by robust data and transaction standards are critical. Segments um, of the supply chain, such as the food industry, have made significant progress leveraging data standards to support food safety and pro uh, product transparency use cases. And so we're gonna discuss the importance of standards today and how business interoperability will accelerate the success of new technologies like blockchain. So um, as an introduction, my name is Rich Mazaros. I'm a managing director at Accenture in our blockchain practice. And one of the areas that I'm focused on is food traceability um, um, within um, um, ha helping our clients be able to leverage technologies like blockchain and others to be able to improve, um, improve traceability within their supply chain. So what I'd like to do is kind of go down the line, starting with Dave here, and ask you to introduce yourself, uh, tell us a little bit about your role, um, and then tell us a little bit about your experience with blockchain for supply chain traceability and how that has shaped your POV, your point of view, um, for this discussion today. So Dave? Yeah, thank you. I'm Dave Checky. Uh, I work at Cargill. Uh, Cargill is a uh, food and agricultural uh, company. We're one of the largest companies in the world that no one's ever heard of, which is always uh, fun to introduce ourselves uh, to a new audience. Uh, I work in uh, our uh, digital labs organization uh, as the director of data engineering, covering a bunch of different spaces, including blockchain. Uh, where Cargill's doing a lot of different things to really uh, drive innovation, efficiencies, and optimizations across our food and egg supply chains with distributed technology and other types of technology too, but more, I think, relevantly for today uh, with distributed technology. Uh, we're seeing use cases emerge across traditional back office type processes uh, for uh, just to drive uh, better trading partner integration. But at the same time, we're exploring uh, traceability and transparency use cases really to help uh, tell the story of our supply chains to consumers uh, and to drive more uh, uh, in improvements in uh, farmer livelihood, rancher livelihood, and just general producers. Thank you, and it's nice to be here. I'm Melanie Noose. I work for one of the smallest companies no one's ever heard of, <laughs> GS1. GS1 is a global standards organization. Uh, we're primarily known for our standards around unique identification in the supply chain, most famously the UPC barcode. Um, versions of the UPC barcode are scanned six billion times a day all over the world, so while we are small, we're mighty. And we got involved in the blockchain journey. I, I lead the innovation team at GS1 US. We're one of 114 country members of the GS1 system. And our job is to help companies in the US implement GS1 standards. And so when blockchain started Entering the scene as, I mean, initially someone told me it would replace EDI, so we figured we better investigate this because our install base in the U.S. of 300,000 members is heavily invested in EDI. And then what we learned is blockchain was really reinvigorating discussions around data sharing and data sharing at levels that we weren't achieving in supply chain to date. So in the use case traceability particularly, we've been on a 10 plus year journey to just get things like case level traceability as product moves from one warehouse to another. And in some categories of product, I would say we have 80 plus percent and in others 20% or less. And after a decade of work, I mean, standards is a slog and everybody knows that. So we thought if we could get ahead of the discussion on blockchain, that we could actually help industry rather than be a lagging indicator. And so we immersed ourselves in understanding how standards and distributed ledger technology work together. The GS1 system is essentially a distributed system. I would say that, you know, the the 
unique numbers that you put on products and cases, there's a portion of that number that is licensed by GS1, but the rest of the system is really run by the members all over the world. So we felt that we could actually build on the notion of distributed. And so food traceability and our work with the panelists here was one of the focus areas. I would say that uh, drug traceability, which was raised th this morning in the panel, pharmaceutical is getting a lot of focus as well. And we have um, standards that support US FDA regulations around pharma traceability, as well as unique medical device. So we work a lot ac across a lot of public and private sectors and felt that it was appropriate to make sure that standards become complementary to technology like blockchain, um, and there was a lot of confusion about that in the beginning. So I think three years into the journey, we're act we've actually done very well to, to demonstrate the partnership between the two. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Banks. I'm a managing director uh, in my role at Accenture, and we're a professional services firm, a large professional services firm with a dedicated focus on blockchain, which is the area that Rich comes from. My focus is to uh, promote technologies like blockchain to try to solve challenges within a certain segment of clients that we refer to as products clients, but it's basically retail, consumer products, life sciences, industrial equipment, and automotive. So you can imagine supply chain are really top of mind for all those clients in that group. So for us, looking at the opportunity of blockchain um, has been of keen interest, but for me personally on the journey, I started in 2016 looking at international shipping as a first use case. So we came out with a partnership, a, a couple of clients like Kuhn and Nagel and APL that we went through, how could we make the, the international trade process, that's the backbone of supply chains better. Uh, and that journey was started really in 2016 and took a couple years to get legs. Um, and I, I really think where we are is really at a, a pivot point in building on that momentum and happy to be part of the panel today to further discuss. Sarah and I have got the uh, sanitary pass off there down. Good job. Uh, All right. <laughs> nice. Oh, no, high five. <laughs> uh, so my name is Patrick. I'm a software engineer at uh, Target Corp, which uh, for those of you who may not be familiar is a large retailer based in uh, Minneapolis, uh, just down the street from Cargill. Uh, for the past couple of years, we've had a few proof of concepts, but currently we have two initiatives. Um, the first of those is ConsenSource, which is a uh, platform built on Hyperledger Sawtooth that aims to improve the uh, tracking and auditability of factories in our supply chain. So for things like um, if a factory is certified for organic cotton and um, the history of that certification, if it's ever been revoked, things along that line. And then also um, we've been contributing to Hyperledger Grid alongside Cargill and GS1 as well. So we've had a um, couple of contributions to the project in the form of some um, reference implementations of uh, GS1 standards such as product and um, most recently uh, we had a um, PR merged for uh, the catalog RFC. So uh, yeah, I'm hoping to bring a little bit of technical perspective to the panel. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, we are gonna, we have some questions I'm gonna ask the panel. And we're gonna to try to reserve a few minutes at the end for any audience questions. So as you think about questions as we go through here today, please jot them down and hopefully we'll have a few minutes to answer them. So I think this first question is for Patrick. Um, we often hear that blockchain is, can, is called a team sport. So why is it important for partners from across the ecosystem to work together in developing these technologies? And how has your experience working with partners helped your learning in this space? Sure. So um, from a technology perspective, um, I think one of the kind of cool things about blockchain is uh, that the technology itself kind of enforces this um, sort of new paradigm of businesses uh, interoperating with each other. Um, to be a little more concrete about that, um, when you're writing a smart contract, uh, what you're essentially doing is taking a piece of business logic and you're making that um, into something executable and immutable, but um, before you can get to that point, the big hurdle is figuring out just what that data looks like, the shape of that model, um, the type of data that is going to be stored on chain. And um, I, I think it's been kind of interesting in the keynotes this morning and um, a lot of the other talks today, kind of seeing just how um, pervasive of a problem that is. Um, I think that the, the technology in a lot of platforms, Sawtooth included, is uh, really at a production state. But the, the paradigm shift of kind of 
going from these walled gardens and silos of data that uh, companies have uh, is a lot trickier of a problem. So uh, to the original uh, question of uh, being a team sport, uh, in order to really open up those walls and kind of um, get all the benefits of a blockchain and having a single source of truth, um, you need to have all of those relevant uh, stakeholders at the table. And uh, I think luckily for us with the Grid project, uh, having GS1's involvement, uh, a lot of that heavy lifting has already been done and that these standards are you know, relatively old. The barcode's been around since the 60s, I think, which is uh, pretty- They look young. The standards look young. Yeah, they look young. So I mean, a good you know, 20, 30 years before I was born, for example. So <laughs> uh, a lot of, yeah. <laughs> A lot of these things are uh, like the, the the interesting paradigm is the model and that like the, the way that the companies are exchanging data, but the the data itself isn't or the type of data that's being exchanged um, isn't really new. The the concepts of something like product in GS1, for example, um, that's something that um, has been implemented at Target for a long time and is uh, very fleshed out, but being able to transmit product data from a supplier directly to target rather than going through all these intermediaries and um, having you know, all of the, the associated complexity with that is what's kind of interesting and novel. Great, Dave? I can add a little, a little bit to that and just kind of how, how Cargill thinks about the importance of industry partnerships. Uh, like any big enterprise, traditional big company, uh, we've been through generations of uh, process honoring cultures uh, and trying to drive efficiencies with things like common process data and technology, like those are the, the talking points you hear a lot in big companies. Uh, and there's different ways to approach that. You can approach it by uh, uh, empowering some uh, corporate group with a bunch of decision rights and then having them ruthlessly apply those standards and govern uh, uh, across the whole organization. Uh, and that can work, but it often doesn't generate uh, buy-in, and it, it often uh, struggles with uh, cultural adoption. Uh, and there's other ways to do it, which is like, hey, let's build uh, a, a partnership ac across the enterprise and get people to rally around a common vision and then work to establish a culture of appreciation for the process data and technology choices that we're all making, right? And so like, that's one business, that's inside our enterprise, which we still struggle with, just to be clear. Right? Those are not solved problems by any means. Uh, but now we're trying to talk about how do we deploy these types of things across entire industries and across entire markets or supply chains. And, and the industry partnerships there become super key because you need, you know, you could try to have like one central group uh, uh, start to assert uh, uh, ruthless governance over an entire industry, but like maybe it would be better if you establish partnerships and work together and establish maybe a set of values like, hey, we should anchor to things like common data standards and these... Uh, reasonably like uh, reasonably young but very relevant GS1 standards. I don't know exactly how we want to classify them, right? But like we all kind of know that language, uh, the language of business between organizations being that. So like anchoring to those open standards can help mediate some of the conflict in a lot of respects. A, it's how we already operate and transact in, in many ways. And B, uh, it's neutral. It's an open standard that's like uh, co collaboratively generated from the beginning. And so, uh, you know, that's where we see the open standards and industry partnerships as being uh, two big cornerstones to uh, these types of solutions. And, and just before I leave this topic, one thing I really have to say from our experience in bringing parties together outside the standard four walls of the enterprise is that the old adage of no I in team is so much more difficult in practice than in theory. And I think one of the things that, as we look at the, the ecosystems that will need to be built to scale, one of the concepts that, that you know, we can look at, which could be greater good, has to be pervasive. And understanding that, you know, it's, it's we're gonna get, I think, more into standards in a minute. Standards are very important, but for people to truly work together and collaborate on data sharing or transforming the way that we work, we need to be able to 
leave some ego at the door to enter into those discussions. And it is a challenge when you try to find use cases based on value for different partners um, to understand that there is value there and the value may not be uh, completely for their own uh, specific gain, but the value is there for the many. And by participating and transforming, there will be value for all. And I, I still think that there is some challenge in our ability to communicate that and get the buy-in at the right level to create those kind of partnerships. And I think the key, Dave, that you mentioned is being you know, open. I think openness is really important in that. Great. So in a moment here, we're going to talk about some challenges to this concept of business interoperability. But I want to just ask the audience, maybe by a show of hands, what do you think is the top challenge that is that we need to overcome from a business interoperability perspective when we put into the context of traceability within supply chains? For the, so raise your hand if you think it's data and transaction standards. Okay, a couple people. What about just the notion of interoperability itself? How do these various systems and partners actually share data with each other? Okay, a few more hands. Last one is, yeah. Well, I, I, it's much more fun this way. <laughs> okay, the third one is proof of value. So definition and proof of value, so having Okay, so let's go through that again. How about standards, data, and transaction? Only vote once. There you go, about three people. Interop interoperability? Okay, probably about six, seven people. And then the definition of and the proof of value. Okay, so about four or five. Okay, so pretty good mix between proof of value and interoperability. So, Melanie. GS1 has existing data standards in place for Items such for for item for location for event information, are these standards enough for the full level of traceability and transparency that customers are looking for today? Well, my cop out answer would be that industry should tell us that. Uh, we actually have been working on that for about three years now. As we entered into blockchain, one of the big questions we started asking, mostly the technology partners, is what's missing. Because we've had an event traceability in, in, in the standard since 2007 um, that essentially allowed you to get to very granular levels of tracking from the point you commission or manufacture an item all the way through to the point you sell or dispense that item. And then I would say over the past few years, um, and that would include transformation, so complex items where you have a lot of ingredients and you're aggregating, you're consolidating, deconsolidating, and transforming things. Um, that is all standardized if you can believe that or not. Uh, and then there are right, identifiers for all of those entities and locations and products involved in that exchange. So I think the standards are there in large part. There could be a couple of business steps that we've now accommodated in supply chain or some things we're doing upstream, particularly if you go to the use case that was demonstrated in the video this morning around the bamboo chair, getting all the way back to the producer of the raw material. I think standards may not yet quite support that. I also think the incentive mechanisms need to support that as well for us to get that kind of adoption. Um, but I would say that in large part, I think that the standard is there and the mechanism for enhancing the standard is actually quite robust. And if some of you may have been in a session I, I was in earlier this morning that was talking about standard development organizations and, and they're by nature set up to accommodate that kind of request from community. So we do believe that foundationally for what we're trying to achieve with traceability of the standards are ready to support that. Now, you know, the question then becomes what part of this is standard and what part of it is technology? And that's where I think a lot of people tend to get confused because they think of standards and blockchain as being mutually exclusive when in fact I think they're quite, quite important. And I'll reserve my other comments for the interoperability question because I think that's the even bigger, bigger um, conundrum. Okay, great. So in terms of standards, incentives, I, Patrick, what else do you think is needed, needed to drive adoption of these types of uh, solutions within the marketplace to really encourage that network effect that we're all seeking? Uh, yeah, so I, I think the key part of that is doing it at scale. Um, so for a retailer the size of Target, um, we have you know, thousands of suppliers. Um, 
both suppliers internally for some of our own brands and um, suppliers externally. And um, the, the key challenge for that with us is being able to just speak the same language as those um, different uh, suppliers. Um, everyone kind of has their own quirks of how they want to transact the data and um, get it from a one company over to Target. And um, I think that's kind of what we're trying to figure out. Okay, great, thank you. So Melanie, you mentioned a moment ago about interoperability, so let's talk about that. How do you define it? What do you think industry oper uh, interoperability looks like? Well, I think I've, I've heard just today what to me is a little bit of confusing terminology because we talk about applications and I think of applications as the tool set we give to somebody to take advantage of a use case, right? I saw one before this session, an application around building a token or an application around traceability. That application sits on top of technology and that technology might be blockchain or might not be blockchain. And then you actually have, so you, you could call one application sitting on one technology an ecosystem because there's a group of us that are gonna use that application on top of that technology. But now when you talk about multiple ecosystems who by, by current nature of where blockchain sits as, as a technology don't inherently talk to one another, right? There aren't, there aren't enterprise Ethereum networks that are inherently talking to Hyperledger Fabric networks today. So I've got an ecosystem, you've got an ecosystem, and what we have to build is, right, is that complete data sharing network that allows us to go across. I think where we get confused is, do I need enterprise Ethereum to be able to talk to Hyperledger Fabric? I don't know. I don't know whether we've talked about this a lot with Accenture around right, preservation of the asset versus just the ability to have preservation of the events. And I can exchange events with you using a common language, a standard, if you will, that doesn't require my ledger and your ledger to have any sort of native technical connection. And this is where I think we as industry, and, and what's challenging even more is industry doesn't know what problem they want solved, right? Like I just want the full chain of custody for this product from birth to sale and maybe even post sale now, uh, you know, with a lot of the IoT and sensors that we're starting to put into items. I wanna know what happens to the product after I sell it. That is a vast array of ecosystems that are gonna to touch that item over its life cycle. And so how do we come back to the common language that allows me to, in a secure, immutable, um, and potentially um, obfuscated way, depending on what kind of role I have, get the data that I need to prove the thing that I want proven. And so I think that's really where we're sitting. I know in the GS1 space and with our community is trying to figure out what exactly do you need to be interoperable and is this really about more than data sharing or is it just about the data sharing piece and ledger decisions can be left to right, the individual players. And there's so many models cropping up. We're just trying to ensure that as we move forward, we don't... Um, I heard it from the keynote stage today that, you know, well, none of, nobody wants vendor lock-in per se. Um, by nature today, the ecosystems are pretty siloed. So I'll open it up to the other panelists. Uh, any comments or anything to add on interoperability? Yeah, I think it really depends on, from, from uh, my perspective, it, which is the, is it from my perspective then? It's not Cargill's perspective necessarily, I guess. The, uh, <laughs> like it's about what level in the stack you're talking about from an interop, uh, like from a tech interop, that's a really fascinating conversation about like, you know, how, how, how do we author smart contracts in ways that they're portable across different networks? Uh, and Hyperledger Transact is an example of a project that allows for like pluggable smart contract engines and uh, would allow you to potentially lift and land smart contracts in different implementations of distributed ledgers. So that's, that's cool and I encourage everyone to learn more about that. Uh, like how do we write uh, how do we write things like uh, WebAssembly? Uh, so there's a there's a smart contract engine Saber in Sawtooth that we also use uh, in a product Cargill built called Splinter uh, that allows for uh, WebAssembly based smart contracts, which are very portable. And I saw there's a, a Fabric Wasm thing now as well. Um, and, and like those types of constructs will uh, at, at the more the tech stack level allow for interop. So at least we don't have to like reauthor a bunch of code all the time. We can plug things in. And, and Grid is really, Hyperledger Grid is really about providing a bunch of like pre-authored smart contracts, for example, that like do basic GS1 based or other open standards based types of business things so that you can just plug them into the network or the application, the app that you're trying to, you're trying to build. But then uh, like interop at the business level is much more, 
you know, aligning on common process. And, and, and that's industry, those are existing industry challenges that, we, that we'll continue to wrestle and work with. And I think that like common process governance is a really, really dynamic and emerging uh, problem for business to solve. Like we, we, we spend a lot of time talking about data and the shape of data, but we don't spend a lot of time yet talking about uh, cross trading partner business process. It's like, like we kind of know how we do settlement. We kind of know how we do logistics stuff. Uh, but but everybody kind of does it a little bit differently, and you've been it's been okay because once the thing hit your house, you could do whatever you needed to do inside, and then make sure that when it came out the other side, that that person caught it and like moved on or whatever. But now we need to really understand a business process across, and that's like a whole emerging domain, I think. So, Beeple for G, GS1 Beeple or something is going to come out. It's going to be great. <laughs> So, so I want to go back to um, standards for a second. So uh, Melanie, a moment ago, you talked about standards and the process that you have to be able to continue to enhance those standards. But I actually, I want to ask Dave the question about standards. And from a business perspective, how do you think about standards? Um, how do we allow the standards to flex as the industry and the technology needs evolve? And how do we maintain the integrity of the standards? Yeah, I think that, like, for starters, that was a th so like the SDO stuff, that's like a three-part question. Absolutely. Yeah, so like the S how we think about it is they should be open uh, and they should be agile and flexible. And I think like SDOs and the governance models that exist for a lot of these things uh, are, are really well positioned to adapt to the types of new problems we're gonna uncover. I would say that uh, one thing that one thing that we all recognize is these are new paradigms. These are new ways of transacting. These are new ways of integrating businesses and supply chains. Uh, these are new ways of doing uh, things like transparency and traceability. And the standards that were built in, in the past uh, maybe aren't well positioned to support the opportunities we have. And so there's a lot of learning and joint learning that's got to happen as we try things. So, the, you know, the standard agile kind of uh, principles of start small, iterate, apply what you think you need to solve your problem, uh, you know, then like feed, get a lot, gather feedback. Like, don't think these are, these, are, these are solved things at all. And so that's where flexibility in both the standard and the implementation of that standard are going to be uh, super, super important. That, I guess that's how we think about it. I don't know if that covered. Great, thank you. Uh, Sarah, thinking about, you know, we talked about in a moment ago about one of the challenges around defining value, you know, as it relates to the the value that will be created by the use of this technology within, for instance, a supply chain. How, what are the value pools that you see associated with enhanced food traceability? And how do we think about the value across the entire industry and ecosystem? So that's also a pretty juicy question there, right, in terms of value. Um, it's a very important question. I think we've evolved a lot in terms of finding use cases for blockchain, that it, we came from a point of like, we have this blockchain hammer and we're looking for nails in which we can use this hammer to apply. I think we're really shifting toward where can this add value? And I think with that value discussion, it's a blockchain and, because typically when you think about supply chain, Blockchain in and of itself can be helpful, but it can't be there alone in terms of emerging technologies. Um, but I think the hopefulness, to get really to the question of value, the hopefulness is traditional supply chain challenges, things that get monitored is service level, inventory carrying costs, certainly there's benefits there, and I think use cases lend to that. But other opportunities around uh, where we've seen use cases, recall management being one, uh, and it was cited uh, this morning in, in the great panel that we started the day off with, um, but also uh, even brand management. So the conversations we're having with chief marketing officers, it's so interesting to me that the majority of our activity right now is shifting to that level of the organization, which tells you like, wow, a typical CIO conversation on blockchain, which is what we had two years ago, is now shifting shifting to let's talk to the chief marketing officer about using the provenance concept as a way to build higher confidence in a brand. And so as we're talking with our clients, if it's coming from a technology lens, it's what does that do from a business angle, I think just shows that there's so much more to be discovered, frankly, in terms of, of the value pockets out there. Any other comments on, on value? Yeah, 
day. I shouldn't turn it off. I just feel like I bump it. The uh, like one of the, the I'd agree with all that. Like we, we see a lot of those same same opportunities, in particular the risk risk management stuff is a really compelling uh, value value proposition. Like we, we we really work hard at Cargo to establish trusted supply chains and uh, sustainable supply chains, and uh, manage the risk associated with supply chain uh, disruption and. Uh, brand impact and like as a supplier if we can provide uh, like visibility and traceability through distributed types of solutions to our customers that's really resonated as well but in addition to that uh, there are these notions of uh, what we're calling like 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 it's many companies will maybe like physically integrate uh, their supply chains to get better visibility and better operational efficiency uh, like a classic example of this uh, is, and I don't know if there's anyone from Costco in the room or not, but like Costco now uh, has their own chicken farms because they sell so many chickens. I buy a lot of them. Uh, but like they sell so many chickens that they thought it would be easier if they just had their own chicken farms instead of like buying chicken, far chicken from chicken sellers. And, uh, and, and those upsides can often be realized uh, when it comes to planning and, and visibility to your supply chain in a virtual way. And so this notion of like using distributed solutions to drive a virtual vertical integration of your supply chain uh, has been very compelling, like for planning purposes and for uh, forecasting purposes and for like, like the, um, imagine real time MRP across your entire supply chain and across trading partners, like give me a break. Like Oliver, White, Oliver White's head exploded when, the, when, you hear, when they talk about stuff like that. So those are really uh, compelling value opportunities across our supply chain in addition to those other great things. So, so in a minute here, I'm going to ask our panelists the, the final, final question and ask them to dust off their crystal ball for a moment and give us some predictions about where this space is going to be two years from now. Um, but before we go through that question, so I'm going to give them a moment to think about that. Um, what questions do we have from the audience? We probably have time for one or two questions. So the question is, is that from, um, uh, 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 from an industry perspective, do we typically see that there's a, a major player like a founder that starts versus a true group of customers coming together to explore a use case? Yeah, it could be more like, you know, let's say for IBM, Food Trust, Walmart, it's kind of like a sure. client there, whereas in the insurance industry, there's more of a consortium mm -hmm. together and say, let's drive adoption. Okay, who would like to take that? Um, so, not, I don't want to be unfair to Walmart because they are a leader, but they're by no means alone. And I think that's kind of the misconception that we have in industry. You're looking at two industry giants sitting here. <laughs> yes, right. But you're looking at you're looking at a ginormous producer of protein and corn syrup and all kinds of other ag products and a huge mass merch retailer that have committed to the technology. And I think in the IBM Food Trust environment, there are many retailers and brands who pu pulled together that whole thing. So, um, you know, going back to your thing about what's your POV, my POV is that there's been a lot of POCs and um, I just had to say that. But um, so I, I think what we're actually seeing is a huge groundswell of industry interest across myriad use cases. And the one of the benefits to a company like GS1, because we, as an SDO, we sit in that neutral space that really tries to operate on just collaboration and leave competition to the, the individual players. We now have eight technology partners sitting at the table with us trying to hammer out the interoperability problem. So these are people who have all built applications, whether they be focused on supplier onboarding or whether they're focused on traceability, whether they're focused on pedigree um, or provenance, a whole variety of use cases, but they're all coming together to saying, that in my opinion, there's two things that are really gonna be needed for, for blockchain adoption to succeed. One is automation, because the amount of data that we need in order to provide end-to-end -end traceability isn't gonna come by asking our berry pickers and our leafy green suppliers to start automating what they do at a farm level. We have to bring the automation to them. Um, and I, the woman from Honeywell mentioned an interesting case about kind of providing the tools to them 
them to get them to adopt. So I think you need automation. The second is ubiquity. It doesn't do any good if you're trying to roll out uh, you know, traceability and consumer electronics and you get 10% of your suppliers to, to participate. We've seen similar challenges with the adoption of RFID in item level RFID in retail, you've got to have a whole category at minimum adopt. And so uh, we're really trying to push for the ubiquity for sure. And I think ubiquity really means multiple ecosystems able to talk to one another minimally at a data level. And I agree 100% with Dave's comment that governance around the data, what's required, what transactions are needed, what events do I need to be able to, to track in order to get the visibility I'm looking for. Um, I think notions of interoperable identity are critical. So I think you should look at the Indy and Aries and URSA projects. Uh, we have notions of identity in the GS1 system that we're actually bringing to bear inside uh, the blockchain and W3C world to ensure that they're digital digitally soundproof as we move blockchain adoption forward. Um, you know, and so I think it's, it's identity, it's governance, and it's data and data sharing requirements that are going to be critical for this. And I applaud the people who have gone out and led because it's a lot of heavy lifting when you're building Hyperledger Grid. Oh my gosh, some of the meetings that we have. And, and we spent like two hours, to Dave's point earlier, like arguing over seven attributes for, for product. Um, trying to get that and then scale that to a really high level. So there, there are a bunch of pioneers out there and, um, and I think we're actually gonna, oh, I'll save my other comment for the crystal ball because then I would give it away. Okay, so I, I, we only have a couple minutes left, so I do want to ask for the prediction. So there's really a two-part prediction is two years from now, where do you think or hope will be on business interoperability and supply chain and two, what industry do you think will take the lead? Dave? Uh, I, th I think, first of all, I think two years is gonna feel really fast. Uh, uh, so in two years, I think what we'll see is uh, small pockets of uh, consortia or uh, individual markets or supply chains working and collaborating together in distributed ways. Uh, as opposed to, like, so the, the, the market will favor that model versus more monolithic, uh, like one, one size fits all type solutions. So I, I think that. And uh, the second part of your question was which industry? Which industry will I, be? I mean, I'll, I will proudly say, uh, I think food and ag uh, for two reasons. One, I think there's a lot of pre-competitive stuff in, in like safety uh, that, that drives uh, really good cross-market behaviors already. Uh, and two, uh, because uh, it's an old industry that, that lagged for a long time on tech, and now I think is ready, like this is a very uh, opportunistic time for, for food and ag to really, uh, you know, not the autom automotive industry, and like that's been like modernizing their manufacturing supply chains for a really long time, maybe like old, older fashioned, old, old fashioned, and uh, right, and so now, like th I think there's a real appetite uh, to, to like leapfrog or, or modernize a lot of these supply chains in, in really cool global ways. If I can have three years, instead of two. Um, I, would, I would say that actually I think we'll start to see traceability data sharing network start form. form. Um, we're actively working on interoperability POCs right now with tech providers, so that should be there in two years. But I honestly believe if you waited till 2023, it's gonna be pharma because drug supply chain security, um, there's a regulation going into effect in 2023 around pedigree, which is just gonna force the converse. They're gonna have to have a way in a distributed mechanism for getting that pedigree data, uh, particularly for regulators. So I totally agree. I think from an industry perspective, I start there. Agree with Melanie that I think pharma is the the right place, definitely for the regulatory push. It'll just just makes it easier, quite frankly, to get there. Um, I would say second to that, though, on the the consumer product side, I think there may be a push more in the luxury sector as well, just because of the rise in counterfeit, especially with the e-commerce marketplaces that are growing, there's been more attention paid to the, the provenance of those products and maybe more willingness to, to fund and frankly, a smaller ecosystem to deal with because it's not as pervasive as a product. Uh, but I think in general, like in two years, if we were to find like one meaty use case, I think that would be my, my dream to see something at scale because I do think there's a notion of unintended consequence that we haven't yet explored, um, that it's great to show all this visibility, but what do we do with that visibility? What does that mean for us? And I just go back to a use case of an orange grow provider, and I've mentioned this before to Melanie and others, that 
you know, where he's like, if I tell people it's genetically modified because my grove would not exist if it wasn't genetically modified, will people not buy my product? And it's like, one of, you know, we're, we get caught up in the attractiveness of visibility, but I think we really need to understand maybe going back to standards. When we share something, what does that mean? And I hope in two years we can start exploring uh, more in that realm of unintended consequences. Yeah, so um, I think in two years, what I'd really like to see and what I hope to see is just a, a larger developer community. Um, I think in um, the context of grid, there's uh, an abundance of work that needs to be done in order to uh, actually uh, bring anything to production involving the, the project. I mean, there's so many, um, so many GS1 standards that need to be implemented, and the, the scale of doing that is pretty large. So I think. Um, just having more developers um, in the blockchain community in general would uh, you know, help solve that problem. And in terms of uh, the industry that's going to take the lead, I would take these guys' uh, opinions over mine, so I'll go with Pharma. Sounds great. You heard it here first. So please join me, everyone, in thanking our great panel today. We appreciate all of your, your answers today. Thank you so much for joining us.